Alors, s'il vous plaît. Uh, so, welcome to our hearing. Uh, if you wish, you can introduce your considerable panel. Uh, although I see you, you're all identified, and that might, might help, but I leave that in your hands. But uh, once you've made that decision, please go ahead and make your presentation, and you will have 15 minutes to do so. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. My name is Norm Bolin, and if the license is granted, I will be the President and the CEO of Starlight, the Canadian movie channel. Before we begin our presentation, I would like to introduce our panel. We have quite a few to introduce because our group includes many of Canada's most distinguished filmmakers. You don't often see them in the same place at the same time, and today they have come together in a common cause. In the first row on my far left is Paul Gross. Paul Gross is English Canada's most popular homegrown star. He co-produced and starred in the hit television series Due South. He wrote, directed, and starred in the comedy Men with Brooms and the historical drama Passchendaele. Both were major Canadian box office hits. Next to Paul is Deepa Mehta. She is the Academy Award-nominated writer and director of Water, the final chapter of her Fire, Earth, and Water trilogy. Her most recent film, Midnight's Children, Mr. was Bolin, adapted if, from... Mr. Bolin, Sol if you're going to give a bio of everyone, that cuts into your time. Just names, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll do that. We have, to be fair. we have to be fair for everyone. Okay. Would you like me to just give names? Or, yes, okay. I, it works, it's your choice, Okay. it cuts in your time. Uh, Deepa Mehta next to Paul. To Deepa's left is Denny Arcan. Next to me on my left is, uh, next, next to uh, Denny is Denis Robert. Uh, on my immediate left is Robert Lantos. On my right is Grant Buchanan, our legal counsel from McCarthy Tetro. Next to Grant is David Cronenberg. Next to David is Patricia Rosema. Finally, in the front row, we have Lise Lafontaine. Now I'll introduce our second row. Uh, at the end, on my far left, is Rick Anderson. Next to him is Paul Gratton. Next to Paul is David Cassie. Next to David is Penny McDonald. Next to Penny is Victor Lowy. Next to Victor is Guy Madden. And then we have Mark Musselman and Hussein Amarshi. The final person in the second row is Ian Capstick. That's our panel. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we believe that Starlight, the Canadian movie channel, fits perfectly with the objectives of the Commission's 9-1-H framework. Robert Lantos will begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Your mic, please. Thank you. Some 20 years ago, I presented an application to the CRTC for a new specialty service to be called Showcase. I propose that the new network broadcast 100% Canadian drama in the heart of prime time. In any other country which has a production industry, the concept of reserving prime time for domestic drama is taken for granted. Yet, in Canada, there was widespread resistance to our application from within the BDU industry. They said two things. There isn't enough Canadian drama to program such a service, and no one will watch it. They were wrong. The Commission granted the license, and Showcase turned out to be among the most popular television services in Canada. And Canadian theatrical films were a key component of its schedule. Under its current owners, Showcase has essentially eliminated Canadian feature films from its programming, as have other broadcast services. In fact, Canadian theatrical films are the virtual orphans of our broadcasting system. Even the premium pay services including the ones which have the word movie in their name, combined devote less than 6% of their schedules to Canadian feature films. And because of the high cost to consumers, 75% or so of Canadians do not subscribe to paid television in the first place. We have come to you today to redress this imbalance, but we're not here to propose a service that is simply 100% Canadian in the heart of prime. We are here to propose a service that is 100% Canadian, 100% of the time. The service will be entirely devoted to Canadian movies, with feature films presented without commercial interruption. These movies are part of our national legacy. Most Canadians have been denied any affordable access to them. One of the criticisms that we sometimes hear is that Canadian films are inferior and that Canadians don't want to watch Canadian films. This is the big lie. The reality is that when Canadians actually have the chance to see Canadian films, 
they do like them a great deal. When people go to theaters, they watch movies they hear about with stars they know about, and these are primarily from Hollywood. About 95% of marketing expenditures are for Hollywood films. Because of limitations in their marketing budget, Canadian movies in English Canada generally are distributed with relatively little advertising and limited theatrical exhibition. Accordingly, there is little knowledge or awareness of them. But none of this speaks to quality or audience appreciation or enjoyment. It speaks to the size of the budget. While there is no way that Canada is going to outspend Hollywood on promotion, we can certainly provide access on an affordable basis. And that is the essence of the rationale for Starlight. Canadians want to see Canadian movies on television, and the licensing of Starlight would be a great equaliser. In the colour brochure you have in front of you, on page 8, you'll see the first thing you'll notice is that the entire schedule 24-7 is Canadian. In the first year, year we'll run set more than 700 films. Over time, that number will grow as our library expands. The Starlight schedule will be carefully organized and curated, which is important. So on Wednesday evening, you may see films from Quebec, subtitled in English. On Tuesday evening, you may see feature documentaries. On Friday, you may see films devoted to a particular genre or a particular filmmaking, filmmaker. And on each evening, you will have a half-hour program introducing the films and the filmmakers to Canadian viewers. This will be a one-of-a-kind channel, celebrating Canadian filmmaking and bringing these films to Canadians who have never seen them before and may not even be aware of their existence. Monsieur le Président, I am honoured to be part of the group backing Starlight. Uh, feature films form an important part of Canada's cultural legacy and nowhere more so than in Quebec where they are widely released in theatres to popular acclaim. Recent examples include Monsieur Lazare, Incendie, Bon Cop, Bad Cop, The Père en Flic, Starbuck, La Grande Séduction and Maurice Richard. But Quebec films are rarely shown in theatres in English Canada and these films are almost never seen on English television. That such an important part of our cultural legacy is effectively unknown in English Canada, to me, is a tragedy. We have heard it said that French and English Canada exist as two solitudes. Sadly, this is also true of our film industry. It is time we address this problem. Starlight is an inspired solution. One of the reasons why Quebec films have wide support in their home province is the star system. This is something that is missing in English Canada. You can only develop stars through wide exposure to mass audiences. So the Starlight Service will represent an important step in supporting a star system in the rest of Canada. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about television and its relationship to film. I'm a filmmaker. I work on feature films that call for your undivided attention without commercial interruption. These are expensive, thoughtful, creative works, and they are designed to be shown in theaters with a big screen. But I would be the first to acknowledge that films also need television to survive. Box office revenue rarely covers the cost of films, and as shown in a recent Canadian Heritage study, most people watch films on television, not in theaters. In Europe, this is widely recognized. Broadcasters in Europe are required by the regulators to invest in and broadcast domestic films in order to provide the wide audience access they deserve. But this is not true in Canada. For their own reasons, Canadian broadcasters have chosen to focus their drama spending on episodic series, often to the exclusion of feature films. So we have a real problem. Of all fiction programming, Canadian feature films have the highest cost, are the most difficult to finance, and are the riskiest to produce. But they also represent the high watermark in Canadian creative and cultural expression. There is no place, however, where Canadians can get consistent and affordable access to our feature films on television. And that is why Starlight is so important. Mr. Chairman, I am here on behalf of Anderson Insight, uh, who, can, who designed and supervised the consumer research for Starlight. Working with Vision Critical, we conducted an online survey 
of a representative sample of 1,007 English-speaking Canadians who subscribe to digital television. More than 90% of respondents said they would support the CRTC licensing a service like Starlight. When informed that the service would be on digital basic cable at a retail cost of three cents a day, fully 70% of the respondents continued to support the licensing of the channel. Something I found striking in the survey is that many respondents noted the opportunities Starlight would provide for young Canadian filmmakers. Yes, respondents love the idea of a 24-hour Canadian film channel, particularly without commercial interruption. But they also strongly agreed the channel would help young Canadians and create economic benefits for Canada. Mr. Chairman, some have argued that video on demand or the internet is the way to go for film distribution. But as a film distributor with experience in this area, let me tell you that VOD is not the answer. Video on demand only works for films you've heard about. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to find it. And VOD costs $4 or more a title. In terms of affordability, the wholesale fee for a year's subscription to Starlight with 700 different films would be less than the price of two VOD movies. And in terms of access, when surveyed, over 75% of Canadians tell us that they are unlikely to use VOD. So television continues to be far and away the key platform. More than providing exposure to Canadian films and building an audience, Starlight would help cultivate and nurture Canadian talent. A central feature of the new channel will be the Starlight Feature Film Fund. This fund will provide full financing for 8 to 12 Canadian feature films a year. This is an historic first for Canada, and it comes at a time where the financing of films is becoming more and more difficult. It will give filmmakers the certainty and freedom to focus on making their films rather than spending their energy cobbling together scarce financing. Starlight will also license some films that are already partially financed and will negotiate with the CMPA an appropriate terms of trade for those films. To me, one of the most exciting aspects of the fund is that it will seek out new emerging filmmakers. It is important to note that we have all agreed that none of us, the shareholders, will be eligible to apply to Starlight for financing. But we will sit on an advisory panel to ensure that the fund benefits from our collective experience. I will be honored to serve on that panel. Three years ago, the Commission set forth very specific criteria to determine whether a service could qualify for an N1H order. Those criteria are tough and they're demanding. The Commission set a very high bar. We firmly believe that Starlight completely meets the criteria. By having a schedule that is 100% Canadian and by devoting at least 70% of its revenue to Canadian programming, Starlight will make an extraordinary contribution to Canadian artistic and cultural expression. Canadians want more access to Canadian films, and Starlight is the ideal vehicle to provide that access. Most Canadians are simply unaware of the depth and quality of Canadian feature films, and that will no longer be the case if the Commission provides Starlight with broad national distribution. Starlight represents an extraordinary opportunity for Canada and for Canadians. And it's all about Canadian consumers who finally can get the films they want at a price they can afford. And now before we conclude, we have a short video to show you about Starlight. Film is first and foremost an expression of our identity through the most important medium of our time. It's always been a struggle to make sure that Canadians are aware of their own film culture. Je pense, et c'est particulièrement vrai au Canada anglais, qu'il y a un immense réservoir de films que très peu de gens ont vu. There have been some 3,000 Canadian films made in English and French over the last 60 years. They collectively represent a significant portion of the cultural legacy of this country. Our purpose is to make them available and accessible in every home, 24-7. Canadian feature films are really orphans in our broadcasting system. There's very little place for them. 
there's been a uh, huge inertia in terms of Canadian broadcasting vis-a-vis -vis Canadian filmmaking. There's no place on the dial right now where you can go, I'm going to see what Canadian fiction writers and filmmakers are, are doing. We're going to give these films a home. The question becomes, how do we actually distinguish ourselves and define ourselves to ourselves? And I think it comes out of the arts, and one of the big components of that is filmmaking. On a développé une industrie qui est mature, qui a du talent reconnu dans le monde entier. Notre cinéma international, ils sont parfois plus appréciés et plus connus à l'international qu'à l'intérieur de leur propre territoire. The reason I got involved was that there are all these wonderful filmmakers who actually feel as passionately as I do. This was a way of uh, supporting something that's very dear to me, which is Canadian film. 70% of every dollar that Starlight receives goes into the acquisition of Canadian films or the production of new Canadian films. Once the theatrical release has run its course, the movies that will come out of this, which we think will be between 8 and 12 a year, will premiere on Starlight and will be our original programming. I think for any Canadian, this is, a, this is incredible value. They're going to get this whole world of cinema, which is both historical and contemporary and looking to the future. You will go to it, and every time you go to it, every day, every hour of every day, you know there's going to be something there for you to watch. And it's something that you're going to want to see because it is talking to you about your own country. The key to more success for Canadian film is to make those films accessible to mass audiences. That will create much more interest and support for Canadian film and recognition of its quality which is very high. I think it's a very culturally significant channel that we should have in our dial. Les gens vont découvrir une extrême richesse de, de, de films. C'est une opportunité pour le public d'avoir accès au talent, autant du Québec que du Canada anglais. Avoir accès à leurs films sur Starlight et qui vont voir leurs films vont les aimer. I think the idea of the channel is timely and utterly necessary. It's very forward-looking, very futuristic, and very exciting. It is our responsibility to make sure that Canadian films get seen. If the world makes sense, this channel happens, and there will be a new wave of Canadian film. It's a very unique uh, opportunity that we have, and I think that's why so many of us are behind this project. We believe that it is actually of national importance. It is part and parcel of the fabric of a country. Your mic, please. Mr. Bolin, you're, uh, you're used to this. You should be able to. Uh, you never get used to it completely. <laughs> We're grateful for this opportunity to present our application to you, and we welcome your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, it, it, I didn't want to uh, seem harsh, but we are an administrative tribunal, and we have to be fair to everyone. We understand. Uh, okay. And um, uh, Commissioner Simpson will start off the questions. Good morning. This is a big crowd. Uh, I'd like to uh, just preface this uh, series of questions by saying that uh, in, in the course of the questions we're about to ask, um, I'd like to try and establish that we're not questioning the contributions, the cultural or uh, quality of craft of, of the film industry, uh, except that as a given. Um, what we're trying to understand is what the impact will be as you move a genre of the entertainment business into another genre uh, with uh, the plan you have. So, you know, I'm going to try and keep my questions uh, to the economic issues, uh, to the, um, uh, the genre issues, to, to relegated to the issue of television, not the quality or the importance of film. If, if you feel that I've wandered off of that and you feel it's necessary to defend the industry, fill your boots. But I, I really don't think it's uh, something we have to get into. Is that fair? Okay, great. Um, my first question is, what is this initiative, what problem is it trying to solve? 
Well, I would just start by saying the real problem is trying to solve is a lack of presence of feature film in the Canadian broadcasting system. <coughs> it's a form of cultural expression, which counts as a program of national interest, but it's vastly underrepresented in the broadcasting system. And we've presented a lot of stats about that, but I'd like to, Mr. Lantos to talk further about mm -hmm. that. Theatrical films are, as I said in my earlier presentation, have become the orphans of the Canadian broadcasting system. There is no parallel for that anywhere in the world where films are made. Um, f for reasons of their own, Canadian, the BDUs, broadcasters have chosen to program their services without feature films. The only area, only places where feature films actually appear are the pay television networks, which 75% of Canadians do not subscribe to, and even within the pay television networks, the tendency is much more towards television series made for TV movies than theatrical feature films. Yet, feature films are the, they are, they are the emissaries of a nation. They are the emissaries to our own population and to the rest of the world. When, when Denis Arcand's barbarian invasion wins the Academy Award, when Atom Migoyans, the suite hereafter, wins the Grand Prix in Cannes, that is something that all Canadians take pride in, and it becomes a moment, it becomes like, when I, it, it's akin to one of our athletes winning the gold medal at the Olympic Games. It is the highest achievement of a, of a, of, of, of mass culture, and it is the, one of the most popular art forms, if not the most popular art forms in the world. Canadian broadcasting system simply makes no room for it, private sector and public sector alike. Less so today than many years ago, although feature films were never a consistent part of the diet of any Canadian broadcaster. As City TV, which used to be, for example, a friend of Canadian feature films, no longer is under its new ownership. It doesn't have any. Um, you can go to the main network, CTV, Global, you will never see a Canadian film, ever. You can go to the specialties and you see fewer and fewer Canadian films. As I said in my presentation, Showtime, when, I'm sorry, Showcase, wrong country. Um, when I, when I, I was the chairman of Alliance, which owned Showcase, and when we first launched the network, had a steady menu of Canadian films, it no longer does. You can go anywhere else in the dial, and all the specialties, you will find the same thing. So we are not here to complain. We're not here to lobby. The lobbying has been done by all the Canadian organizations that represent feature films for the last decade to 10, 20 years with very little effect. What we're here to say is this. Broadcasters have made it crystal clear, the BDUs have made it crystal clear that Canadian feature films are not desirable from their point of view. That is their business. They're extremely desirable from our point of view. In fact, that is the only thing we do and it's the only thing we wish to do, is to devote a network to that format which is currently absent and which consumers have virtually no access to unless they're willing to go on a determined search and pay a lot of money for them. Canadian films 24-7. Uh, I'll direct my question to Mr. Boland, and you can stick handle as to who uh, should uh, reply. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, in, in your orals this morning, you said that you know, the, the essence of this service, and you just confirmed it, uh, is to provide access uh, to Canadian content, Canadian films, uh, on an affordable basis. Um, I go back to the written submission, uh, which uh, said that um, if you were to have a lower than proposed wholesale rate, it would compromise the service's objective of investing 70% of revenues in feature films, Canadian feature films. So if you were to put a ranking on access or exhibition versus funding, which would be first in terms of your company's objective? Well, uh, that's a tough question to answer because our application requires access and funding because any channel uh, that is broadcast to a wide audience requires its own original programming. And the funding we require is funding to have our own original programming so that every few weeks, every month, we'll have new Canadian feature films on our channel that are exclusive to us, just like any other channel. So that's a very, very important part of the business plan for this channel. But when we asked you to, uh, to run some numbers and look at different scenarios, 45 cents, 35, 25, when you reached uh, a threshold of 25 as an example, uh, you essentially responded that uh, it would defeat the purpose of the service because uh, 
there wouldn't be the money to fund new productions, but if you were, uh, if, the, if the intention of the service was at least on an equal footing, 50% of its objective is access, why wouldn't a 25 or a 20 cent uh, subscription fee allow you to at least exhibit, if not create new content? Well, I would just say we did model those various uh, models, Commissioner Simpson, and at 25 cents, the channel really isn't viable at all. But there were other uh, rates that where there was a possibility of the channel still operating, but Every penny that was uh, taken from the wholesale fee led to a reduction in Canadian content and the kind of original first-run programming the 9-1-H category uh, requires. So, uh, you know, we are mindful of the consumer and we looked at different points uh, of financing. Uh, we looked at higher points of financing as well and we tried to find the sweet spot where we could deliver the kind of content that audiences expect and need in order to be attracted to a channel while at the same time mm -hmm. keeping the price reasonable to consumers, particularly relative to other uh, sources of, uh, of Canadian feature film, which are very expensive in the system. I don't know if anyone would like to add to that. This is always the not fun part. You know, the, in funding feature films, you want to get past that and get to shooting. I understand, but the numbers are where we live. So, uh, I, I, Mr. Lantis, if I may, I, I, I'll just uh, tack on to Mr. Bowen's uh, uh, testimony. Where I'm going with this is... Um, in looking at the numbers that you provided, uh, on, on if you were to receive uh, uh, 91H carriage uh, complete with a subscription fee at 25 cents, you'd still have an average PBIT over seven years of 14, almost 15 percent. So it's not that it isn't viable. If I may, um, our mission with Starlight is twofold. It's to, on the one hand, to bring the entire legacy of English and French Canadian films to every Canadian home, to create easy and inexpensive access for all Canadians to their own films and their own stories. That's one, one part of the mission. The other part of the mission is to create original programming so that we are able to bring fresh films with a, the, the appeal of them not being available anywhere else, any other way, films that will be part of our, a very significant part of Starlight's budget has to do with marketing of the movies, films that will be heavily marketed, unlike many Canadian films, so that by the time they get on Starlight, they will have been heard of. Now, we could run a service uh, for a, with a lower uh, subscription rate, but we would not be able to accomplish both of these objectives. Frankly, we start, when we started discussing Starlight quite some time ago, we, are, we ran models on all kinds of numbers, and a lot of them were considerably higher than 45 cents. And we were, we were very pleased with the results because we said, wow, the amount of money this would generate for new Canadian films at, say, a dollar a month would essentially triple the number of Canadian films being made today. It would be a, a godsend to the Canadian feature film industry. And then we said, but consumers are probably not going to be happy paying for it. So let's find a sweet spot. Let's find a balance. Let's find a price point where, which is not prohibitive, which is, which is in the context, as I'll let Denise address what 45 cents might mean today, but which is certainly within the reach of everybody, within the reach of the high school students who, um, as you'll probably, as you'll hear from Real Canada in a few days, um, for the most part, have never been exposed to a Canadian film. But when it's brought to them to their classroom, they overwhelmingly want more. And they, it's within their reach as well, whereas, say, a VOD at 4 or $5 a film is not. So we looked for a sweet spot, and that's where we arrived at $0.45, cents, that w which allows us to do both, our, to accomplish both our objectives, including a steady stream of original feature films heavily marketed. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, one of the things that is very important in Europe, as you probably know, the investment of broadcasters go beyond 50%. A few years ago, the Canadian broadcasters would go up to 8% and in the past couple of years have gone down below the 2% mark. This is a great first for the uh, cultural industry to have a broadcaster committing so much money into the development and nurturing of young filmmakers. I'm the mother of a 17-year-old daughter. 
and her whole generation is overexposed to American products, American films, American programming. And I'm very concerned for her future and the future generation of viewers. And I think that the fact that this feature film fund will concentrate on young emerging filmmakers who will tell their stories or Canadian stories and make Canadian films that will speak to this new generation of viewers will increase uh, their uh, appreciation of what we do in Canada and our Canadian films and on a long-term basis. Uh, the uh, uh, consumers, there are tomorrow's consumers and they'll certainly be far more influenced in buying Canadian because they will appreciate it, they will love it, because it will be part of their daily uh, uh, living of being able to open the television and see 24-7 a wonderful Canadian film. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add? I'd, I'd like to add uh, a point about the number that you advanced, Commissioner. Uh, what did you suggest? The I was, I was talking about looking at Mr. Buchanan. I was looking at uh, the projection at 25 cents under an approval uh, before uh, the investment fund. Uh, in other words, I was looking at the PBIT margin before spend uh, in investment, and I was looking at 25 percent PBIT in the first year, uh, 10 percent uh, in uh, year six. That's what I was looking at. In other words, if um, this is provided by staff, so perhaps we can do an undertaking uh, to clarify that afterwards, because I have been wrong before. About well, no, it, it, no, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that. I was, oh, I was trying, to find, it, I, I'm trying to find that, that number, and I can't. Yeah, but, well, I, I, but we my do. interpretation of this table is that um, at a 25 uh, cent subscription fee if there was to be no investment in new product. Uh, you have a positive PBIT. Well, so we'll get staff to uh, advise me on I, that. I can comment because you did ask us in deficiencies to run a yes. model at 25 cents and yeah. that is that is on the record and that is what we have okay. available to us. But um, PBIT's an, an interesting construct because it, it avoids the fact that there's bank loans and yeah. you know five million dollars in bank loans. Like, there's an awful lot of things that you have to ignore right. to get to your PBIT number uh, right. that wouldn't be realistic. But I think the summary from the 25 cent rate was uh, the fund eff effectively gets dropped down to one film a year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what that's what you heard. Uh, that saying. that could so, well be. Uh, why I was <coughs> going this line of questioning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is because I'm trying to. Again, uh, divine uh, a less than perfect world into if we can't have one, uh, w which of the, the two would is more needed, funding or exhibition? You know, when I look at the numbers that are provided to me, um, I see, uh, and this is from CMPA, uh, your old alma mater, Mr. Boland, uh, that about $381 million was, uh, was, was spent in theatrical spend. I don't know if that's totally Canadian content or that was co-productions uh, or, or runaways, uh, but uh, I, I see the disparity in uh, theatrical spend versus uh, the overall uh, in terms of what goes to television and the like. Uh, but we'll get into that later. I'm trying to just divine whether we have a funding issue or we have an exhibition issue. Well, I, I would like to just uh, speak briefly as a former broadcaster. Any broadcaster operating a channel or a group of channels is mindful of the balance that's needed between exhibition of library programming and exhibition of original new programming. And we were very mindful of the 91H requirements when we put this application together. One of the elements that's required under 91H in order to get mandatory carriage is a significant contribution to original first-run programming. Mm -hmm. But we did try to balance the amount of original first-run programming to make the cost affordable to consumers while at the same time delivering something that's going to engage them. You need as a programmer to have your own slate of ongoing content. If we just became a rerun channel, yes, we would still be distributing the library of Canadian films historically, but we would not be creating new films that are our very own and they're, that are exclusive to our service and are important for driving audience and driving interest in the channel. Okay. If I may add to this, please. To answer your question directly, there is, if the license fee, if the license fee is considerably lower than 45 cents, 
we could certainly fulfill the mission of bringing all Canadian films to all Canadians, films that have already been made. The cost of acquiring on a non-exclusive basis uh, Canadian films from various libraries of some of them two years old and some of them 20 years old is consider is it can, we could accomplish that and we could have, as we have promised in our application, some 700 films per year, which would be refreshed each year. Uh, and this we could do. But original making a film, even on the low budget, on the lower budget side of things, as we sort of have projected between two and four million dollars per movie, in addition to some uh, films that are financed by others, which we would acquire the first television license to, is is a whole other, is a, economically, is a whole other world. So we have reserved some six, six and a half million dollars a year for the licensing of films. And yes, we could technically run a channel on that, but we would have very scarce original programming. And in order to get on our feet and be someday, when if you choose to license us when, and on a mandatory basis, when that is up, to no longer require mandatory license in order to be competitive in the marketplace and to, despite the fact that we will not be BDU owned, which is certainly a major disadvantage in our country, but in order to be competitive in the marketplace, we will need original programming and we will, over the course of seven years, accumulate a considerable amount of programming that will be exclusive to Starlight and will be, at, at, and will be in a position to offer a great deal more of it to subscribers than if we don't have any. Mr. Commissioner, if I may um, interject, I, I would be very sad to see the funding aspect of this proposal erased or really reduced because I fear there's a serious talent drain happening in our country right now. We are losing a lot of extremely talented young possible filmmakers to America and to other professions because it just isn't easy. It, it was far easier. When I started out, I took it into my head to become a filmmaker. It took me two months with the Ontario Film Development Corporation to come up with some cash and make a movie. It was relevant. It was a reaction to the moment. It was a um, it was easy. This, this isn't about me. It isn't about us. We don't benefit from this, but I go to schools and I don't know what to tell kids. I don't know what to I see many fabulous stories. It's, it's, it's still an exciting, you know, sexy field for, for young people, but they don't have a place to go. This would sort of massively increase the Canadian, fresh, contemporary Canadian youthful content that could be out in front of the viewers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Boland, uh, going back to uh, the uh, statistics from 2010 to uh, 2011 at CMPA, uh, could you help me understand out of that $381 million, I'm, I apologize if I'm throwing a number at you, but I think you were there and may be familiar with this number, but in the $381 million in theatrical film production in Canada in that period of 2010-11, uh, what percentage of that, uh, of that money was totally domestic, 100% Canadian. All of it, some of it, what percentage? Do you, do you know off the top of your head? Uh, I know. I don't have uh, an analysis of that number okay. for you uh, right now. I could yeah. try to do something yeah. uh, for you. Does, does anyone have a, a comment on that? Well, I don't have exact numbers, but we can approximate. <clears throat> Telefilm Canada's annual budget is under $100 million. Uh, considerable portion of which is spent on various programs that do not have to do with feature film production. Feature film production in both languages combined comes to $60 million. That's their share of investment. Mm -hmm. On the average, on Telefilm Canada tends to be a, a finance here, according to their own statistics, they tend to finance about one-third, 32 percent or so of the cost of most Canadian films. So if you multiply their $60 million by three, you're about $180 million of genuine Canadian production, which does not include service productions or productions that are simply made in Canada, but actual Canadian films. So the, probably, and I just said, I'm basing this on Telefilm's numbers, I think the, that the number is closer to $200 million a year, French and English combined. Okay. Thank you for that, because uh, I was poring over the, all the stats, and uh, when I got into the British Film Institute or uh, uh, the Australian uh, 
uh, uh, statistics, you know, they broke out what they called inward investment from uh, domestic investment, and it made it a lot easier. So that helps a tremendous amount. Thank you. Um, just not to put a fine point on the issue of 45 cents, but, you know, I'm a healthy skeptic that BDUs are not going to pass this through without some markup. And uh, in a worst-case scenario, 45 cents can potentially, from a statistical uh, or from the statistics I've seen, could go as high as 90 cents to the consumer, and it would put somewhere between two and two and a half percent on top of the you know, the basic bill. Have you thought about that, and do you have any opinions as to um, what that does to the consumer? Well, for the research that we did where consumers more than 70 percent showed that they would uh, uh, support this channel at three cents a day, which is 90 cents a month, we did mark up the wholesale fee by 100 yep. uh, percent because that is the way the market has been working. We didn't want to be seen as being unrealistic. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that the BDUs could offer this service for a much lower retail rate if they chose to do so. Uh, their marginal costs, including profit, on delivering this channel to consumers is much lower than 45 cents. Absolutely, we know that. We also know that uh, they have other means to, uh, to defer uh, any retail markup. For instance, the low LPIF is being uh, uh, phased out. Uh, that money could be applied towards new services on BASIC without any increase in wholesale fees to the consumer. Uh, I know the Commission doesn't uh, regulate those fees, but I think it could send a message that in the case of these 91H services that you do choose to license, if you choose to license any, that it's a special situation. You're dealing with extraordinary Canadian contribution, and perhaps the BDUs have participate in that contribution. Last question on this uh, particular line. In your research uh, that you just referred to, you, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the question methodology was focused toward want. And uh, is there a want for Canadian content? And uh, is there a desire and ability to pay up to three cents uh, for that? Um, but 91H is tricky because it, you know, a lot of the determination as to what's, what qualifies for 91H, 91H through the Act is, is more determinant upon need. And would you like to comment on whether your, whether your research, uh, you know, fully well, dealt with the need? I'd issue? like to. I'd like to have Paul say something on that. We've been discussing that within our group, and it's something that we uh, we're very mindful of. And so, I'd like Paul to add a comment. Thanks, <clears throat> Mr. Commissioner. Um, I, it is something we've been discussing quite a bit, the, the, and how we go about defining the word need. I think it's. I think it's a little. It's something that's very difficult to quantify particularly if you go and ask people, do you need to see such and such? They may not know that until you actually offer it to them. And in a, to a great extent, I think we're really talking about access where the need would present itself or prove itself or manifest itself. And I think all of us have anecdotal evidence that that need exists quite profoundly inside and across Canada. Our colleagues in the this venture from Quebec have proven that over and over again in the Quebec model of how <clears throat> they took their films out. I mean, if you look back 20 years ago, there wasn't an enormous amount of demonstrated need to see Quebec film. But they took the films out into the regions and made it go into all of the smaller communities, and that need expressed itself to the point that today they have built a really formidable star system. In uh, my own experience of working with Robert on Men with Brooms, we took, at least tried to do a modified version of the Quebec experiment and apply it across the country and took men with brooms into very small communities which ordinarily wouldn't necessarily be on the exhibition trail of distribution and the need expressed in smaller communities like brooks like blind river like corner brook was extraordinary and actually eye-opening i think to most of the, the people involved in the distribution of the film um, on a more personal note i can say that the that need expresses itself in, in, in the cultural importance, apart from just the, the numerical importance. In odd ways, I am going to be doing a film that's set in Afghanistan, and I was in Afghanistan on a couple of occasions. Uh, and every soldier I ran into had seen Passchendaele. Passchendaele had played over there in the Quonset Hut across from Tim Hortons. And they would stop me and say, thank you for the film, or I enjoyed it, or... I hated it, <laughs> but, but every soldier had seen it, and, 
General Andrew Leslie is now retired, but at the time was the commander of the Army, said that the, the film was extremely important to the troops because it gave everybody, it gave them, not only could they see, but they could feel the long line of their own history, that their history working in ISAF dates back to the formation of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in 1914. I think this kind of need has so many different levels. I think the numerical need proves itself over and over again when we have access. And my feeling, as always, I'm a populist, and I've always felt that we need to get our, our, the material we make into every household in Canada. This cannot be done in anywhere in the world simply through theatrical distribution. You have to do it through television platforms. And in large part, I think what we're saying is we don't have that. There is no avenue inside the current broadcasting landscape. It's clear that most of the BDUs do not want to be involved in this for reasons that make a great deal of sense to them, and, and to some extent to me personally. My, I, I get their business model. What we're saying is, okay, we understand you don't want to do it. Let us do it, and the need will prove itself. Mr. Commissioner, if you... And again, uh, j just uh, on the same line, I made the number of films over the years that these films are shown every year in major European countries. I know because I receive royalties, for which I'm very grateful. But still, why would uh, Englishmen, French, Italians, Spain, Spaniards have this need for my films, whereas they're not shown in Canada? Uh, that's that's a bit strange, and I, I, our assumption is that there is this need. Uh, it just has it has to be bring to the people. Commissioner Simpson, if you would indulge me, and Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge us, I, I think this is a this is a central point in your determination of whether a service is going to qualify for 918, and I think we would like to address it in a couple more ways. I'd like to call on Rick Anderson in a minute, but first, this is something I was actually talking to Deepa Mehta about last night, and I was profoundly touched by what she had to say, and I think I'd, her comments on need would be helpful to the Commission in terms of making a decision about the need for this service. Um, as, a, as an immigrant to Canada, and uh, I've been here for more than 30 years now, but uh, I've always said that uh, though India inspires my stories, Canada gives me the freedom to express them. There's something uniquely wonderful about Canada that it gives that license to a filmmaker, and a filmmaker of color. The first film that I did um, was called Sam and Me, and I remember going to a funding body, and, uh, and they said, the script is great, but it's, but it's about colored people, and you're a woman. Uh, and they did, I didn't get the money. But the point is, today it's different. If a younger filmmaker now of color, or because the point is in 30 years, you know, Every fourth Canadian is going to be non-Caucasian. And how are they going to, what, what are they going to find? How are they going to see themselves reflected in our films? We really need that. We need, we, I mean, Canada is about inclusion. It's about that freedom. And we have to have films that reflect that. I mean, I know immigrants will not go to a movie hall because Hussein and myself have worked on this to see a film. And I, when I talk to them, and you know, whether it's in, in schools or whether it's in the Peel Health Center or, or different, different areas, I, and I say, why won't you go? They said, no, we'll go and buy a pirated DVD because they'll watch it at home. And what Starlight will do is actually make that piracy impossible because it'll be there. I'd just like Rick to make a final comment on the research, and then we could take another question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we asked the question ourselves three different ways in our research. Uh, first, we uh, provided uh, respondents with a written description of the service we're proposing and asked them if they would like to see this launched. Eighty-four percent said yes. We then provided them with a video, not dissimilar to the one that you've seen today, but an earlier version, uh, and 93 percent said that they would support the licensing of the service. And then we asked them the tougher question. If it cost you three cents a day, using the marked up retail figure <clears throat> that Mr. Boland was referring to, 70% still said they would support the service, uh, which of course is a pretty high number and in our opinion meets the test of widespread uh, acceptability of the service as enunciated in 91H. 
I would also draw your attention to uh, some, some data that was published by Canadian Heritage last fall uh, in which it was reported that nine in ten, this was not done by ourselves, uh, in which it was reported that nine in ten respondents agree it is important that Canadians have access to Canadian films, 90 percent. Uh, and 73 percent of respondents <clears throat> said that it, Canadian broadcasters should show more Canadian films on television. And lastly, I would, uh, I would make two, two points. First of all, that people are not shy when given the opportunity and research to say that they don't want to support something or that they don't want to buy something. Uh, we see that in lots of uh, consumer research, that people shy away and say, no, I, uh, you know, great idea, but no thanks, I don't want to pay for it. Uh, that's not what we see here. We see 70 percent saying, even at three cents a day or at three cents a day, I would support the licensing of this service. Uh, and lastly, we see lots of evidence beyond consumer research, actual behavior where consumers are spending more and more of their share of wallet on the acquisition of content of various sorts. It's never been higher. Uh, so that people are, uh, you know, from their own perspective, judging that this is something they need. Uh, content, whether it's broadcast content, cable content, uh, DVD purchases and rentals, theatrical ex ex uh, exhibition, or other kinds of content, people are spending a great deal of their, uh, of their consumer disposable income on this because they judge that they need it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's get over to exhibition for a while. I'm, uh, I'm sort of beat the numbers thing to death, uh, I, although I probably will circle back on a, on a few items later. Um, I can't help but wonder, uh, you must have contemplated that uh, opening up your own, not orphanage, but adoption agency, let's call it, uh, to have Canadian films adopted by more Canadians, um, you are going to, in essence, be competing with your own product on other channels. Did you, uh, Canadian feature films, I would have to believe, enjoy some exhibition on other channels, including, you know, the fact that all releases have to be available on VOD. So is there some kind of a regression analysis that you've done to, you know, are you robbing Peter to pay Paul by uh, giving uh, broadcasters the option to exhibit fewer Canadian feature films and uh, uh, because you're providing a necessary service? Robert will speak to that if you don't mind, Mr. S uh, Commissioner Simpson. <clears throat> Commissioner Simpson, the reason why this we're all here today, this was not an idea born overnight. This was many years in the making. And when the Commission called for 91H applications, then it, that gave us an opportunity to gel thoughts that we have had for a long time. Those thoughts come from a, the extraordinarily frustrating and really unparalleled situation that it's not so much that we face as filmmakers, because those who are here in this panel today are all successful at their craft, and they, and it's, so it's really the, the, what I find particularly difficult to swallow, and Denise Robert mentioned it earlier, is that Canadians are deprived of easy, inexpensive, thematically curated access to our product. It's not because it's our product, but because it's and of the 3,500 feature films that have been made in Canada over the last 50 years, we only made a very few of them here at this table. It's about an entire national legacy. Now, you mentioned that the films that we may be robbing Peter to feed Paul, but first of all, the channel, uh, the Starlight is going to acquire older films strictly on a non-exclusive basis. So, Anybody else who wants to license them and play them, the more the merrier. What we are going to offer is a curated service where each, in each evening films will be introduced by their filmmakers, including 30 and 40 year old films. Films will be brought up to date, it will be thematically presented, and with a few exceptions, to answer your question, Canadian films are in fact not available in Canadian broadcasting. You know, if you travel around the world and you are in place like France or Italy or Germany or other places, and you turn on the television set in prime time, you're likely to stumble onto a domestic feature film. Um, it, several nights a week. You will never stumble onto a Canadian film 
on a mainstream, on a, on a conventional over-the-air Canadian network, ever. You will not find one ever on Global or on CTV. And the CBC has cut way back on their Canadian films down to very few, a very few a year, in, especially in prime time when people are actually watching television. So if we felt that Canadians had adequate access to Canadian films, we wouldn't be here. Um, we all have day jobs, and we're doing this because we all strongly feel, and the evidence is available. The statistics are totally available. They're, the only place you can consistently find Canadian films, and as I said earlier, in declining number, are the premium pay television services, which most Canadians don't get, certainly not young Canadians, which is our particular focus. And I could just add a couple of numbers to that to illustrate it, because I don't really think that the other broadcasters are trying to use feature film in a competitive way as part of their core offering at all. And they can if they wish, because we're not exclusive in terms of most of our content. But in between 2004 and 2011, the premium movie services, TMN, Movie Central, and Super Channel, reduced their Canadian feature film exhibition from 13% of their schedules to 5.2% of their schedules. We put this on the record. It's in our reply to interventions. And specialty services between 2004 and 2011 reduced their feature film as a portion of the schedule from 3.3% to 1.7%. So there's not much out there. It's, it's not something that they're going to be uh, concerned about competing with. They've decided to abandon it for their own good reasons. I was a broadcaster. I understand this trend. It's, there's nothing malicious in it. It's a fact of life that if you're a commercial broadcaster, it is much easier to market, promote, and advertise long-running dramatic series than it is to promote feature films which are one-offs. We're going to embrace one-offs, and we're going to create a schedule that thematically embraces one-offs and organizes them in a way that makes them accessible, and then we're going to market and promote them and advertise them in a significant way in order to build an audience. And we don't think that takes away from any other service in Canada. This is a question I, um, I have to ask, but uh, we've mandated that in VOD, which I believe is available to everyone, unlike having to have a, uh, a movie channel subscription, um, we mandate that uh, all Canadian theatrical releases have to be available on VOD. Um, I understand your value proposition of 8 to $10 a year is a heck of a lot better than $5 a download when it comes to buying movies uh, because you get the whole gamut of Canadian films for uh, if you were to enjoy a 91H. But on the basis of VOD now, how are Canadian films doing, understanding there's an economic barrier? Well, we happen to have an expert in the room on that, and oh. that's uh, Hussein Omarshi, who, who is a film distributor who puts a significant focus on Canadian film. Um, okay. Commissioner Simpson, we distribute films in Canada and we distribute s several Canadian films and VOD is a window that we, we use. Uh, we go through all the broadcast VOD services as well as iTunes. Our experience is, with the exception of one or two films, that most films do get lost in that VOD jungle. I mean, there is a lot of VOD uh, uh, availabilities and every week there are new titles going in. So you have, on a week like last week or two weeks ago, Django Unchained comes out. If you have a Canadian film that, that's coming out that week, which is, I mean, the way the VOD service works is that every week they feature the new films that come out. That's, that's your window. The second week, the generally, the, box, the, the number of rentals drops 50 to 80%. If you happen to be coming out on the week that you have Django Unchained or some other big Hollywood film, there's no chance that you will get noticed. That's the, the constant reality. The second part is that, you know, I mean, again, as we mentioned before, that Canadian films have that, that intrinsic problem that we do not have the kind of marketing power, the marketing muscle that establishes those films at, at, at the theatrical stage. Now, we do some, but not most of our films. So when you have a situation like that, when you, people don't know what the film that they, you know, if it just shows up on the channel, on the, on the, on the, on the, on their, on the screen with a little, little box, chances are that they will not recognize that film. And that is something that, that is, that is just the nature of that, of that service. Now what we are proposing is something different because we are talking about highlighting our films by thematically sort of positioning them. So there is a certain context that will give it, I mean, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a leg up. 
And that is what, what, what at the end of the day, we, we have a very, you know, yes, it's great that they are, they are mandated, mandated to take all the, all, the, all the Canadian films, but it doesn't change the, 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 the problem that we are dealing with. And it gets back to Mr. Lantis's point that this, this would be a curated channel that uh, would manage its assets much differently. I understand that. And I also understand how we're outgunned in the spend. Uh, you know, the ratio that I've seen in, in the U.S. is anywhere from 2 to $3 in promotion to every $1 that goes into the camera. So I understand that. It, it, it's a problem, and hopefully that will get corrected. Um, Mr. Commissioner, could yes. I add to that, yes, please, absolutely. on the VOD question? Yeah. Uh, your indication uh, appeared to suggest that they all must be on there. But, you know, the night we got the interventions, uh, we compared the schedule that you have in front of you at page 8 uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, brochure there are 80-some-odd uh, titles there, including half a dozen curation things. Uh, there were 78 feature films on there, a lot of them you may recognize. There were six on the Rogers VOD service that night. So I don't know where the all of them are, uh, if they're supposed to be on there. Perhaps they're on the ones that are affiliated with the movie services as opposed to the Rogers VOD service. Th those are the ones, of course, that you have to be a subscriber. You have to be one of the whatever percent it is of Canadians who subscribe to those movie networks in order to get that, uh, get access to it. Don't know, but they didn't appear to be there. And in the, in the reply document that we, that we tendered, the evidence is that 75% or more of Canadians don't use VOD. Anyway, so A, they don't seem to be there, and even if they are, people aren't using it. But you know, if they do, it's four or five bucks each. Those six that we talked about, the cheapest was three ninety nine, but there were others at five ninety nine. So this service that we're talking about here gives you a whole year's inventory for less than that. So why, you know, <laughs> it's not a consumer way to a consumer friendly way to consume Canadian feature films. Put it that way. That was very, uh, yeah. very instructive. And the expense of testing your patients, I'd like to say more about VOD. Please do. Um, the whole VOD business is a hit-driven business. It is based on the th thesis that people will have heard of so the films that they have heard of but did not see in movie theaters are going to seek them out because they have been so heavily marketed that they know them and they're looking for them. This does not apply to the overwhelming majority of Canadian films. Let me correct that. This does not apply to the overwhelming majority of independent films made outside the six Hollywood studios. Because the studio movies have today an average marketing budget of around $70 million each. So they, they, their marketing budgets are designed to drive their product through all the windows. So those who don't see them in movie theaters, and only a minority of audiences see films in movie theaters, will recognize the title when it appears on, pay on, on video or DVD, on VOD, and various other formats, and seek it out. This does not work anywhere near the same way for films that people do not enjoy a $70 million marketing budget. People don't actually seek them out. And VOD is based on... Is a, on, on it's like destination programming. It works mostly for films that people are looking for. We're proposing something entirely different. I also may say, not to dispute your numbers, but there are 